Okay, so today's focus is on the following wide spread of tools. I'm thinking of it as a kind of an ecology of tools, and I hope that you'll be comfortable with that idea. Um, the green tools, gradebook and gradescope and rubrics and Turnitin are largely educator facing tools in that they are supportive for grading purposes. Okay. Um, the orange tools in the middle, this row over here, are both student and educator facing, and they are a really good way for your students to participate in a grading, a graded process. And then the tools in the kind of slightly paler yellow on the side over here are tools that are really, that don't link easily or conveniently to gradebook. Um, and are tools that are perhaps more useful, especially the first three for informal assessment, although the blogs tool is also quite useful for formal assessment as well. You just won't be able to automatically grade it to your grade book. Okay, so what we've done with today's presentation is we've broken it up. We're going to start with these core assessment tools in the middle here, tests and quizzes, assignments and forums. And what we're going to do for each of those, we're going to talk you through what the tool does um, and typically what a student would see and experience with that. And then we'll move on to this little green block, the grading oriented tools. And then finally, we will move on to the little yellow batch, which is the sort of informal assessment or not easily formalized assessment tools. Is that okay? If you have any questions, again, please remember either interrupt or jump straight into the text chat and one or the other of us will get to you. All right, then, Aaron, can I hand over to you? Would you like to share your screen or do you want me to just tell me when to go next? Uh, yes, let me share my screen. Go for uh, it. I will stop so sharing. That, okay, that's fine. Okay, let's go. Go. Okay, folks, can you see my screen? Not quite yet, okay. but it may be getting there. I can see that it's starting. Okay. Yeah, my network is a little bit, you know, erratic today. There we go. Got you. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you very much, Shanali. Thank you for the introduction. Okay, so, so I'm going to be talking about the test and quiz tool, the assignment tool, and a little bit about the forums. So I'm also now going to share my other screen so that at least I can actually be talking and doing some things at the same time. Okay, let me share my screen one. Okay, uh, Shanali, can you confirm if you can see the first screen? I can indeed. Sorry? I can see your screen. Oh, you can see my screen, okay, all right. Okay, so the, the, the test and quiz tool is a tool that is used as, as the name entails, that is used for setting tests uh, and also quizzes. So basically it is an assessment tool. Uh, <clears throat> now quizzes, they, they actually range from, from different uh, types of uh, questioning, uh, sorry, from different uh, types of questions. You can have multiple choice questions, you can have essay questions, you can have short answer questions. So on Vula, uh, on the left-hand side, if you don't have the test and quiz tool, in this case, I have it already, but if you don't have it, you can go to site setup so that, that you can add the tool. So I'm on a site called Shisanyama here. So this could be your course site. 
and then you go to manage tools, which is selected already in this case, the manage tools tab. And then you scroll down to look for the test and quiz tool. Okay, so in this case, it's already ticked, but I mean, if it was not there on the left hand side, it wouldn't be ticked. So all you have to do is to tick the box and then you click continue. And then you would then click finish. So in that case, then the test and quiz tool would then appear on the left hand side and it will, it will actually show, okay. All right, so one thing to, to note about the test and quiz tool is that uh, we, when you set a test or a quiz and students are to submit, none of their submissions get checked uh, on turn it in. So that's an important thing to note. The test and quiz tool is not linked to turn it in. So this is about a test that would have said the students will answer the test and then they will submit and then you have to mark or grade the test. So in this case, for example, I'm just going to show you quickly uh, how to create a test. So if you click on your test and quiz tool on the left hand side, then you are presented with these tabs here, the assessment, the aid, the question pool, the event log, a user activity report, and then the trash. So if I'm to add a new test, so then you get presented with this box. So you have to write the assessment title or the name of the test. So probably I can just say, for example, test one. Uh, and then and then you create the test. Now, when you create the test, you can actually add the questions here. You actually need to choose the question types from this list. Uh, so you choose the question types. That, so if you want multiple choice, which is quite popular, so you just select multiple choice and then you get presented with this screen, which you have to fill out. So the point value is, is represents the number of marks for that question. And then you type the question in this text box. If there are attachments that are associated with the question, you add an attachment here. And then you now write your answer choices or the answers that the student is going to choose from. Uh, there's also a feedback optional, uh, which most people don't actually include. So, yeah, so we've got A, B, C, D. And then after that, at the bottom here, you can actually choose whether you want the questions to go according to a particular, whether you want the answers to be arranged according to a particular order or you just want them to be randomized. And then when you finish uh, setting up all the settings, then you can just save the question and then you go on to the next question. So basically this is how, you know, questions get added to a test and quiz. I mean, if you are setting up questions from scratch. Alternatively, you can also have uh, questions which are in a question pool. Uh, so you can actually add a question to a question pool or you can add a set of questions to a question pool that stays permanently uh, on Vola and you can always make use of, uh, make use of those question pools to add some, questions or to set some new uh, tests uh, and quizzes. All right, so after you set your test and quiz, then the students or participants, they receive a notification that this the test has been set. Uh, I'm just going to show you quickly. Uh, so for example, in this case, I've got test one here. So the students will be able, so currently it is still a draft. What you can actually do, you can also, you know, set some settings here on, you know, what you want the test to be like. I mean, in terms of the dates, when you want the test to be written or when the test is going to be available. Uh, in this case, you can actually start with an introduction that explains what the test is all about. And then there are availability and submissions. This is where you can set up um, 
when the test is going to be available or when it is going to be due uh, and has a limit time of. So this is how long the test is going to be. So the test can be due on a particular day, but you also need to set the time, how long the test is going to run. If you want it to run for two hours, people can take the test for two hours. And then if you want to accept late submissions, you can actually set the setting here. Uh, and then also the, last, the latest late submission date, you can also set it up here. Uh, and then now the auto submit option, this is, where, uh, this is a setting which allows a test to be auto submitted when the time lapses. Uh, so this actually helps the student because sometimes when students take a test, they forget to say submit or send. So as a result, you know, if the auto submit is selected, then the test just gets automatically submitted. So there are other options that you can also select. All right, if you want them to take the test from a specific location, you can set it up here. And then you also have exceptions. Um, so the exceptions option is for, let's say you've got students who have got uh, special needs or who need an extended time or if the set is generally set for one hour, but you want these students to sit for, for example, one and a half hours. So you can actually use this exception to, you know, add these students. Uh, if the students belong to a particular group, you can also select the group here, and then you can set the dates and the times, and then you click add an exception here to actually save whatever you would have added. Okay, so the next option is for grading and feedback. So this is actually where you set up um, how you want the test to be graded. Uh, so, and also how you want the feedback to be structured. So when a test, for example, a multiple choice, it gets automatically marked and then you might want to send a feedback to the student based on, you know, based on the question that they would have answered, you can actually also add the settings here of, of what type of feedback and how you want the feedback to be, you know, to be uh, relayed to the, to the student. And then the last one is uh, the layout and appearance. So this is how you want it to appear to the student when they are setting the test. So there are various options here that you can actually choose. Uh, so this is more like just cosmetic, but it's also good so that at least you, I mean, students find the test, you know, much easier to navigate as they are writing it. Okay, so basically that's it about the test and quiz tool. Uh, I don't know whether there are any questions so far from what I have said, uh, like we said earlier on, Shanali said, you know, feel free to interrupt. So it will be quite nice if, if there's someone who wants to either ask or, you know, add a contribution to, uh, to do so before I move to the next uh, tool that we are going to talk about. Aaron, uh, yes. Dita has a hand up and I'd like to uh -huh. invite him to unmute and speak. Okay, thank you. Uh, Aaron, just a yes. uh, point regarding the availability and submissions. Um, my experience uh -huh. has been that uh, you, one can rather leave the auto submit uh, disabled because uh -huh. at the end of the test, it simply just uh, will submit whatever's been saved, even if it hasn't been saved by the student. Because I've noticed that if you do activate auto submit um, uh -huh. and the student hasn't saved, it simply just auto submits uh, blanks. Uh, and then the test sort of uh, ends up <laughs> with a blank test, uh -huh. even though the student would have, would have entered. So I tend to leave auto submit um, disabled and then let mm -hmm. uh, the submission handle itself. Yeah, but I would think auto submit would actually kick in when the time has lapsed. But no, so, it would. Mm -hmm. So if, 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 if the test is supposed to end at two o'clock, let's say the student starts answering the test and then probably stops at some point, and then at two o'clock, 
then auto submits, then automatically submits everything. Those things that were pending, those that have been saved and, uh, and so on. So the, the danger is that sometimes if it is not selected and then when the test lapses, there's a danger that some of what the student would have actually done may actually not be submitted. Yeah, oh, okay, understood. Yeah, in, a, in other words, it gets saved, but it doesn't get submitted. So sometimes then we receive requests to say there are some assignments that are pending and so on. So what we now do on our side is to select auto ad, auto as auto submit, but then it takes long for for those um, for those uh, tests to be submitted. Sometimes it takes about twelve to twenty four hours. Normally, if we select auto submit today, we normally advise the the user to wait, you know, so that it can run overnight and then they can check the following day. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. It does take quite a while. It's almost a day. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's almost a day. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. And thank you, Dita. Uh, there is another question in the text chat. Um, mm. I would like to invite Claudia to unmute and um, ask her question. Thank you, Shinani. Um, I'm uh, looking at. Um, Having something where the students submit um, something that they've worked on sort of offline, but it has all the pros and cons of the assessment, um, you know, for example, getting those um, options for different answers um, coming up and, and so forth. So I don't know if that quite makes sense. The reason is um, students uh -huh. don't always have the facility um to you know they don't like having to be online for one and a half hours two hours and some of my don't really require that but the, the tools um you know the all these bells and whistles are very nice to to have to augment okay if i oh sorry oh did you finish finished hello Okay, sorry, there was a break up there. All right. So if I understood you well, uh, you would want students to work on a test, but uh, not necessarily being live in the test. More like work on it offline, and then they would then have to submit. Is that what you mean? Basically, yes. Okay. Well, with, with tests and quizzes, that becomes a little bit tricky because I'm not very sure in this case how they would then probably submit it. Can you just probably clarify how would you have structured, would these be questions that would have been mailed to a student to complete? Well, um, that's, a, that's one way that it could be done. I mean, if there was an option within this tool to, mm -hmm. to do something like that where they got the questions and then they could kind of go offline and come back and actually um, mm. but, but uh, there are probably other ways to do it but I just mm. thought it would be so nice because it would all be um, mm. yeah. and the options to sort of provide um, mm. um, alternatives yeah. and such yeah, that works quite well with an assignment tool which we are going to talk about I mean after this because the, the main the main reason for for a test and quiz too is at least to have something timed something done within a, a specific you know timed period now the assignment the assignment tool is much more relaxed you know you set up an assignment you give it a due date the student works on the assignment you know in whatever way you know in a much more relaxed mood and then after that they submit so with an assignment tool, there is that flexibility. With a test and quiz tool, unfortunately, well, it might also depend with the situation and the circumstance. But in this case, you know, we want to try and put a student into a proper test or exam kind of a scenario. Yeah, where they actually, you know, do their test within, within a timed period. Thank you. I don't know if I've answered you adequately. Thank you. Shanali, I don't know if you want to chip in there. Um, 
No, Aaron, not specifically, but I do think that we probably need to move on. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. I hope there's no one who... Okay. All right, let me share my other screen. Okay. Okay. All right, so we are now going to look at the assignment two. So that assignment two, as the name entails, is mainly, you know, it's a tool that is mainly used for assignments. So normally an assignment gets created, there's a due date for that assignment, and then <clears throat> students are expected to submit the assignment. So the one very good thing with the assignment tool is that students have got an opportunity to upload their assignments and have them checked on Turnitin. So Turnitin is a, is, a, is a tool that checks to see the amount of plagiarism or the amount of matches that what you have written uh, has with you know, other submissions that have been made or other academic submissions that have been made. Right, so with the assignment tool, there's also an option. You can either have the 1018 tool selected or you can also have it deselected. It all depends on you know who is setting the assignment. And there are a number of file types that can be accepted on the assignment tool. Web documents are accepted, uh, PDF documents are yeah, compatible. You can also upload audio and video tools, but the audio and video tools do not go through turn it in. So there are a number of reasons why, you know, students might want the assignments or lecturers might want students to have the assignment uh, go on, on turn it in. So with the assignment tool, you can actually specify the number of submissions that a student can do. So what basically means is that a student can submit and then he can check the report and then realize that maybe they are, the, the, the matching percentage is too high and then they can still, they can then go back, work on their assignments and then submit again up, up to a point where they feel, you know, their, their matching scale or matching percentage is low enough. Uh, then they will then have to download uh, the Tenetin report and send it to their supervisor or send it to their lecturer. So I'm just going to quickly show you how the assignment tool works. I'm going to be quite, quite fast because I can see we are running out of time. So let me just share my other screen. Shanali, can you confirm if you can see the screen? I can indeed. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so this is the assignment tool on the left-hand side. So if I click on it, then it shows this platform here. So if I want to add a new assignment, then you use the Add tab. Uh, you can actually add a new assignment here. So you can put the assignment title, you can put a description or some instructions for your assignment. If you wanna add some attachments, you can also add an attachment. Now the availability is, you know, the start date for the assignment and also the due date for the assignment. Accept until that is if there is uh, if you want students to still submit after the due date, then you can actually set up a date here. The accept until date. Yeah, then there are some other you know uh, options here. Set a reminder, email twenty four hours, hide due date from students. It all depends on what you would prefer. Okay, then assign to each individual member of the site, or you might actually assign the assignment to a group. So if your class, your class might actually be divided into various groups and you might want the groups to work on different aspects of probably a particular topic. So you can actually give each group a different assignment. That, that's why we have this option of groups. And then student submission, submission type. So you can actually select how you want the assignment to be submitted. 
it can be attachments only, it can be inline. Inline means they're actually going to type on, on the Fuller platform uh, what their answer or what they what what their uh, response to the assignment is. Uh, it can also be non-electronic. It can also be a single uploaded file only. So if you want to allow resubmissions, you can actually select here so that you know students can submit and resubmit. Now, if I tick here, it actually gives up this platform where you actually have to specify the number of resubmissions that you would want to allow. Okay, so if we scroll down, you have got the turn it in option. So if you want the assignment or the submission to go through turn it in, then you have to tick uh, this box here. So what it means is that the assignment after being submitted, it will go through turn it in and then turn it in will verify or will analyze the assignment and then it will then give a report which we call a turn it in report with the a percentage that shows the amount of uh, plagiarism or the amount of matches that the assignment has with other submissions that have been done in the past. So basically the Turnitin works with the Turnitin repository or a database that stores all the submissions that have been submitted through Turnitin before. So one thing to note is that uh, if a student submits an assignment on the same uh, course site and they have to continue submitting and resubmitting, uh, it doesn't pick up matches because it's the same student, the same course site. But the moment they submit at other course sites, then Turnitin sees that as a different person. Then when they resubmit again, then it, it then shows a very high match. So that's one thing also to be aware of. Yeah, then after you put all your settings, uh, grading also, you can also select grade this assignment. Or you can also hide submitters' identities if you want them to be anonymous. Yes. Then after that, then you can just post your assignment. So basically, this is how the assignment tool works. Uh, and then once you post, then students obviously receive a notification and then they can take the assignment. And then, you know, you can actually then later on grade the assignment. Uh, over to you, Shanali. I don't know if there's anyone with a question. I'm not seeing any questions in the text chat at the moment hmm. about assignments, nor am I seeing any hands. Um, but if there are any questions, folks, about the assignments tool, now is the time to ask. Aaron, I just, uh, oh, I see EK's uh, hand is up. Okay, go for it. Uh -huh. oh, okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tadevi, and thanks, uh, Shinari. Um, I just wanted to confirm what you just said, Aaron, uh, yes. because I didn't know about it, about uh, uh, Tony Teen, because um, we, try, we, uh, we try to advise our students you know, in being able to uh, 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 make sure that the uh, even when they have high similarity index that they, this is referenced. Mm -hmm. So if yes. I understand you correctly, what you're saying yes. is that if if the student if if I put in multiple uh, for the students to be allowed to sub submit, let's say like two or three three times on the same yes. course site, and the students mm -hmm. make the submission, that mm -hmm. uh, when the students gets the Turnitin report and sees that uh, the mm -hmm. similarity index is high, the student is able to work on it and resubmit. And uh -huh. it will, because uh, my worry was that when they resubmit, uh -huh. it would already have checked the previous one uh, uh -huh. against the database and then probably get uh -huh. get a higher percentage on the second try. So from my, okay. from my understanding of what you're saying is that uh -huh. uh, Turnitin does not check that, you know, if it's on the same course site. Yes, if it is in the same course site, Turnitin knows that this is the same person. All right. So if you submit the first time on the same course site and then you submit again, turn it in, it recognizes you as the same person. So it does not, you know, it does not uh, increase your matches. In other words, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't consider that second submission to be a plagiarized submission. 
because it knows that it's the same person. But if you submit on a different course site, then Turnitin sees that there's a different person, even though you are the same person. So right. that's thank how you. it works in this case. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, I'm just going to uh, briefly show you what the report looks like just for you to have a, uh, to have an idea. Uh, let me just share my other site. Okay, so this is an example of what the tenant in report looks like. So the number at the top here, which is 27%, this, so this is the total match. But this 27% uh, is actually a number from these percentages Hello. on the right hand We're side. Not yes. We're seeing that um, site. Not... Oh, that okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Is it visible now, Shanali? Yes, it is. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, sorry, folks. Okay, so so I was saying this is what a tenant report looks like generally. So it shows it, you know, so when, it, when, when Turnitin looks at your assignment, it highlights areas which match other submissions that have been done in the past. And then it shows the percentage here, an overall percentage for the match. So this gives uh, the submitter of the assignment or the student an idea of, you know, how much, you know, how much, plagiarism or the amount of matches that his submission has with, with uh, other submissions that are on the database already. <clears throat> uh, then, yeah, this is just a brief description of what Turnitin is and, you know, just some notes on, just to get people to know more about Turnitin. Uh, so now the last, tool I'm going to talk about, I don't have a slide for it here, but I'm just going to discuss it briefly, is the forums tool. So a forum is basically a communication tool. It's a tool that, you know, uh, lecturers or uh, course conveners use to communicate with students. So I'm just going to show you here, uh, let me just bring up my other screen. My apologies, my network is a little bit slow. So sometimes screens take long to appear. So Shanali, can you please confirm if you can see the first screen? Shanali? We can see. Hi, Aaron. Sorry, my network went to you for a second there. We can see your <laughs> Google screen, yeah. No, thank you very much, Shanali. Okay, so, so the forum tool, like all the other two, also appears on the left-hand side. So with me, here is the forum tool. I'm just going to click on it. So like I said, this is a communication tool that uh, course conveners or lecturers use to communicate with students. So what happens is that with, with forum tools, you can add a new forum and you can also add a discussion to the forum. So for example, in this case, you can give the forum a title. You can also give it a short description. And then if you want to add attachments, you can also add attachments to the forum. So basically a forum is more like, you know, a, a, a particular, topic that you may want to discuss. So for, let's say, for example, you have just had a lecture and you want students to talk about that lecture. So you create a forum for that lecture. You can also create different topics under that forum. So if you want to discuss about the times of the lecturer, if you think students probably they want the times to change, you can create a topic within that forum, a discussion topic, and then so that people can be very specific on how they are participating to that particular forum. So basically this is how a forum works. Uh, it's quite straightforward how to create a, 
a forum and also so you can also uh, grade a forum depending on how the students have participated you can actually you know link it to the grade book and then we've got permissions here you know the different roles on Vula and the type of permissions you want them to have on a particular forum and then after that you save and yeah then basically that's how a, a forum works so yeah so from me that's all at the moment i don't know if there are any any contributions or any questions on the three tools that i've uh, just talked about otherwise over to you shanali thank you aaron folks while i'm changing up screens if there's anybody who has a question that they would like to ask now is a really good time to do that um, please feel free to unmute and to share any questions that you would that you have about the tools that Aaron has been talking to us about. Okay, I'm not seeing any unmutes, but if you uh -huh. if you have any questions over the course of this section, please, please, please do feel free to just jump in and ask. I'm hoping that everyone can see some slides. Can you see slides? I can see, Shanali, we can see. Ah, fantastic. Thank you so much, Aaron. Yes. Okay, so folks, what we're going to do at this point is we're going to move on to talking a little bit about some grading tools. Um, Vula has a number of different grading tools at the moment. Um, and I guess the first grading tool I just want to remind you of is the one that's hidden in tests and quizzes. So in tests and quizzes, for example, in the short answer questions, in the multiple choice questions, the hotspot questions, you can set the auto grading, which means you provide the answer in the tests and quizzes tool, and it automatically marks those for you. And that links to gradebook. So I think a gradebook is kind of the anchor space for the grading tools in Vula in that all of the different grading tools, tests and quizzes, rubrics, um, not turn it in, but grade scope, all link to the Vula gradebook. So what Vula gradebook does is that it's a space where instructors or educators can calculate a student's grade. So you can feed in weightings, you can feed in percentages, you can tell it to pick the best five out of seven and so on. Um, where it stores basically your students' cumulative grade and it stores each of the grades that add up to that. Okay, so students can view their scores across a semester for a whole variety of graded options. Um, and as I've said, tests and quizzes, forums, um, the assignments tool, and the rubrics tool all feed very nicely into Gradebook. So that's our first tool, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Our next tool that we're going to talk about after that briefly is we're going to talk about the rubrics tool. The rubrics tool is very useful um, at the point at which you want to offer feedback to your students as well as give them a grade of some kind. Um, you can also just grade on this or just offer feedback by not weighting it, by not giving, um, giving it a score in the grade book. So this is a, a tool where you can create a rubric, you can share a rubric, or you can customize an existing rubric. Um, again, I will show you briefly what this looks like. We won't go into the setup process today, it takes too long. Um, also, what you're able to do via the rubrics tool is you are able to leave comments for your students, and you are able to leave comments for your fellow markers. And we'll talk about some of the benefits of that in a second. Um, and it links very nicely, as I've said, to the assignments tool and the gradebook tool. The next two tools are not uh, native to the Sakai environment, to Vula. They're both third party tools that are integrated into it. Um, and so they don't necessarily link as well. Uh, Turnitin is, has a, Aaron has already talked about matching software element of it, but it has a grading suite, which can be very useful. Um, some of the features of the Turnitin grading suite include things like a quick mark. What that is, is it allows you to create 
multiple comments that you might use repeatedly um, across a batch of student works. For example, say for a midterm essay or for a particular reading response. And instead of having to repeat those comments individually one at a time for your students, you can simply kind of click and drag them onto the relevant points in the student document. Um, it also offers things like rubrics, voice notes, but it does not link to Gradebook as well. This may change. Um, Gradescope is a new tool in the UCT grading tools space. Um, it's a pilot this year, so depending on the uptake, whether or not people like it when they use it, um, it will either remain in the um, in the grading tools basket or it will leave us. So I would strongly encourage you to have a look and see what you think about it. Gradescope is incredibly useful for STEM subjects. So for the sciences, for any technologically oriented subjects, for engineering and for mathematics, any time that you might want students to work out a problem in writing, or any time that you might want students to draw something and annotate it. So perhaps even in the health sciences for process drawings around bodily systems, etc. cetera. Um, what it does fundamentally is that it's a kind of page to digital um, storage system. So you and grading system. So your student could answer a question on a piece of paper with a drawing, with little calculations around it, et cetera, and then simply take a picture using the Gradescope um, tool on Vula that would upload it to their Vula, uh, to the course site and so on, and to the particular, um, uh, particular task in Gradescope. Um, and you could then mark it in that, and the student could have access to that as well, the marked version. Um, a very cool aspect of Gradescope is that it enables people to mark across questions. So you can mark the whole of question one, the whole of question two, the whole of question three, which last year we couldn't do with assignments when we were having students kind of upload images of things. So those are the, those plus the forums tool are the primary grading tools in Vula um, that you need to be aware of. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to take a few minutes and give you a bit of a sense of what those look and feel like. And there are follow up webinars on each of these different tools because they do take a little bit of setup and um, there's a little bit of thinking around pedagogic strategy in relation to each of those. Okay, so what does Vula Gradebook do? As I've said, it allows you to calculate, store and release information to your students. Um, what's really useful is that your students can see things as you release it to Gradebook, um, which means that you there is no excuse for a student sort of then coming to the end of semester and saying, I didn't know I was doing this badly. Um, it's also a really motivating thing for students who are doing well to see how they're doing. And it's a great way for you to encourage students who are perhaps struggling or falling a little bit behind to come and visit you or to call you or to make an online appointment with you because you can leave them a comment in Gradebook as well that says, please give me a call when you have some time or please make an appointment to chat via Teams or whatever your particular preference is. What Vula Gradebook looks like from the lecturer's perspective, and I'm sorry, I had to cut a bit here so that we could have it at a good size. Um, what you will see for a particular course is you will see your student names on the left-hand side here. You will have items. So essays, for example, or tuts, this would be one section. There'd be another section for tutorials, another section for presentations or whatever it is that you wanted. And you would see what the students' grades were as you enter them in, for example, assignments. If you mark it in assignments, the grade will pop in here. If there is a short answer quiz in your course, the grade will automatically pop in here. And so you can keep an eye on how your students are doing and who's keeping in touch with things and who isn't. What this looks like for a student is, for example, here we have Stephen Johnson and Stephen will be able to see what are the different assignments he has, what are the different discussions, the exams, the TUT questions, whatever categories of work that you have decided 
are relevant for your course. He will also be able to see what weighting there is for those, um, and he will be able to see any comments that you put into Gradebook. So from a student perspective, this is a really good way of helping for helping students to understand whether or not they're keeping on top of things. Okay, so that's Gradebook. Um, our next one in the list was the Rubrics tool. Um, and I think critically what I wanna say about the Rubrics tool is that it can be very, very helpful in two spaces. Number one, it can be incredibly helpful if you have a marking team. So if you have a number of tutors marking, then a Rubrics tool can be like a memo, can be an incredibly useful way to standardize your tutors marking. So that some students don't end up with a fantastic mark for a particular essay answer and a very similar answer gets a really terrible mark from another tutor. So it can standardize your, your marking across a group. It can also standardize your marking just internally for a single person because sometimes I sometimes find myself being meaner to the first people that I've marked than the people I mark at the end or vice versa. Um, and so it can help you achieve that kind of both internal and external consistency. Rubrics can speed up marking, particularly for things like essays, reports, um, any kind of long piece of text. A rubric can be very helpful to focus your attention on what you should be marking as opposed to perhaps how somebody uses hyphens. Um, and then finally, and this is actually the big win in my mind with rubrics, is that they can make the feedback that your students get a lot more meaningful. So let's look at what those look like from the staff perspective and from the student perspective. So from a lecturer perspective, you will have your student text that pops up here. And you will have this little button here that you can click on, this little grid looking object. And that will give you the rubric that you mark on. We're not gonna get into it in detail today because time. Um, and this is what your student will get back. In order for you to mark this, all that you would have to do normally is that you click on a block and you double click over here to confirm the grade for it. And so it does speed up marking substantially in terms of having to repeat yourself. And I think that's quite useful. Okay, so let us move on to the next tool in that little bundle of grading things, Gradescope, which is very new. Um, Shanali, sorry, yes, go I didn't for it. My hand. Uh, on rubrics, one one quick yes. question: Can can one so if I have a rubric with say with two criteria, very simple, yes. can I uh, weight the criteria? Yes, you can. Okay. You can indeed. Um, so you can either weight. Uh, I think the way that rubrics weights is it would say to you give something. Uh, so I could give, let's say uh, I was marking the whole thing out of 100, I could give one criteria 80% and one criteria 20%. And that would internally weight it. Thomas, is that okay? Okay, cool. Um, so actually, I think Thomas, given where you are, I wonder if this grade scope tool might not be the way to go for your for your kind of context. I, if I recall rightly, you said human biology. Um, is that like partly the biomechanics people? Exactly. Uh, yes. so that, yeah. Okay. So something like grade scope, which has both the qualitative elements, but you know, when students are handing in drawings with annotations, for example, um, or designs of particular things, then Gradescope works really well. And it has a rubrics element. So I would say again, for like the STEM subjects, Gradescope is definitely something to look at. Um, and just a heads up, there is a Gradescope webinar coming up um, quite soon. It's very new to us as well. And so we've got someone coming in from, um, from Gradescope to do some training. So if you would like to sign up for that, uh, it is on the Silt Events site and it will be on the slides as well. Okay, Thanks, cool. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to skip by quite quickly here. Critical things about Gradescope, you can mark directly on the submissions really a time saver. Students don't need to log in separately. It all happens via their Vula site 
And those are things that enable marking, uh, Gradescope also, as I said, enables marking across questions. All useful things. Okay, so those were the big marking tools. And then finally, in the last two minutes, I wanna just whiz through very quickly some tools that I think that are perhaps underrated because we don't think of them as marking tools. Um, thank you, Susan. I, I hope to finish just before that. So there are four tools that are currently available to you in Vula. WooClap is new. It should say pilot at the bottom. I'm sorry it doesn't. It will the next time these slides go up. WooClap is also a pilot tool for us this year. It's primarily a polling tool. It gives you more than 15 different types of questions, um, including things like MCQs, et cetera, and students can like or upvote questions. It's primarily intended to be used synchronously. So during a live lecture, for example. And so if you are doing things like a seminar with your students and you want to break it up with questions, WooClap is an awesome opportunity to do that. It is an assessment tool in that it is an informal or formative assessment tool. It can give you feedback immediately on where your class is. Um, if you use it as an asynchronous tool, um, in other words, something that your students could do over an extended period of time, it behaves more like a homework function and students can't then see how other people are doing on it. Okay, the blogs tool is an oldie but a goodie in the Vula network. Um, and essentially what it does is that it enables students to upload either text or images to a very simple looking blog space. It uses a rich text editor, so um, very familiar looking from a kind of, it would look a little bit like a word processor, basically. And students and staff can set the blogs as either visible to, to a peer group, to a cohort, or as private. Really useful tool, again, for getting students to give each other formative feedback. So if you wanted to have um, a kind of a process writing approach to an essay in your course, you could get students to upload a draft and make it a requirement that they comment on a couple of people's drafts. Um, and blogs allows the commenting. However, it does not nicely link to gradebook or to turn it in. So it's not a good place for final pieces of writing. So quickly, uh, two other tools that were on that page, the comments tool and the chat tool. I just want you to see what they look like. This is the comments tool. The comments tool can be embedded on any lessons page. Um, so let's say, for example, you had a video and you wanted your students to comment on what they thought was the most interesting, disturbing, questionable, problematic, whatever, element of that video, you embed a comments tool directly underneath that video and your students can answer into that space as you see that they have done here. Again, doesn't think to turn it in and not directly gradable, but a really good way for you to figure out, did my students get what I was talking about in the last 15 minutes of this video? Um, can be used very nicely with the continuous assessment um, sorry, classroom assessment techniques that we've been talking about in some of the other assessment webinars. And last but not least, the chat function. Um, again, the chat room can be used as a really useful formative assessment space. Couple of provisos. Number one, it's a very flow of consciousness space. So it kind of burbles along with a brook with people answering each other and answering previous questions and coming to something they said two weeks ago. So it's not a very organized space. Forums are better for the structured, organized um, sort of conversations. But we have had people in the last year use chat rooms at specific times. So they've said to their students, I will be in the chat room from two to three on a Wednesday um, for a live chat discussion on X. And there has definitely been some uptake on that. Similarly, um, lecturers have used that with tutors. So tutors have set up um, inside the, the course, the lecturer sets up chat rooms by tutor group, and the tutor is in the chat room for that amount of time to answer a particular set of questions or to support students who have questions. Okay, so what next? Sorry, it's been a whistle stop today. 
But basically, just a gentle reminder, the SILT resources page, uh, you get to it via the SILT homepage, um, click on teaching resources, it will take you through to the SILT resources page, and all of the assessment resources are tucked under assessing learning over here. Dieter, you have a question. Uh, sorry, Chanel, just a quick one. No the worries. Comments tool that you said yes, uh, could be embedded uh, in yeah. your lessons page. Is there any way to link that? Maybe I've missed it to forums or maybe Q and A no. or no. Yeah. Okay. So the, the the comments tool is entirely separate from the forums tool and from the Q and A tool. You can embed both the Q and A tool and the forums tool on a lessons page, but it will take you. It kind of pops you out of the lessons page and into the forum. Understood. Cool. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, so reminder about the resources. Quick punt for support and services. If you go to the SILT homepage, there are a whole range of services open to you from webinars to departmental webinars, which you can request on specific topics to one-on-one -on -one support sessions, um, videos, guides, etc. Please feel free to take advantage of all of those.